that record and here goes this record and you are good to go all right we are back with terry and gary's low expectation cast and today we are joined by the world's most dangerous man that's you ken yeah, shamrock ken Aaron, that's right i was waiting for you <laughs> well, what well, at one time known as one punch ken shamrock and then i became a mixed martial artist fighter <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, um, thank you for doing our podcast and, uh, you know, Terry and Gary's Law Expectation podcast. So don't expect much out of us. The questions aren't tough. We're just happy to have people to come on. <laughs> uh, no, no worries. Hey, uh, so there's three of us here? Yeah. yeah. You know, Dave, uh, that runs the Detroit podcast, he just bounces out. Every once in a while, he'll show off his bar that he has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right now he's using his bar. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. So now um, you're currently with Impact Wrestling. How long have you been back with Impact Wrestling? Wow. Uh, I guess coming up on October, uh, I believe it's a year. Yeah, a okay. year. Yeah, I, I actually debuted in Bound for Glory last year. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, it was just uh, such a big thing. When, uh, when did you decide you wanted to, you know, get back into pro wrestling? And did they contact you or did uh, you contact Impact Wrestling? Yeah, it was kind of a, a funny thing is because, you know, I was, you know, I was involved with uh, uh, Battle Championship Wrestling over in um, Australia. Uh, I was a tag team champion with uh, Carlo Cannon. Uh, great guy. Uh, in fact, I miss uh, working with him. A tremendous person. The, the company was uh, a kind of a small one, but it, it was running shows all the time and uh, I got an opportunity to go to Australia and work over there. And once I went over there and I went one time, I thought I'd just give it a shot, see what my body felt like. Cause I'd taken, I don't know, a, couple, a year or two years off from anything. I wasn't doing anything, no training, no nothing. It just rested. And then I started feeling the itch again, started putting some feelers out and got in touch with battle championship wrestling. And um, they uh, said, yeah, come on up. We could use you for a match. And so I went up and had a match and, I felt, felt surprisingly really good. Like, wow, like what, you know, I mean, I thought I was going to be sore and as I was training, getting ready for it. I started feeling really good. And then when I had my match, I was doing my first match back after about two years, I did a hurricanrana and a dive over the top rope. Yeah. Um, so I was just like, man, I feel real, real froggy, you know? And so I started actually putting out more feelers. And I remember what got me in contact with impact was, um, Brian Cage uh, yep. was talking about some stuff and mentioned something and I, I mentioned something back well the world's most dangerous man uh, uh, might be willing to be to, to break the cage break Brian Cage um, something to that effect where we were kind of friendly because I respected what he was doing and I, I was definitely watching him and I thought he was a tremendous for being a big guy in the way that he moved I was a big fan of that and so we had some conversations. We talked trash a little bit. And next thing you know, I get something from um, Scott Deal Moore saying, how would you like to come and, uh, uh, you know, check out uh, Impact? And so uh, we started talking. And unfortunately, I never got a chance to work with Brian. Um, that's what I thought they were bringing me there for, was to get something with him. But uh, this thing with Moose kind of erupted where he 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 chimed in, started talking some trash. And I kind of piped back at him saying, who are you? I don't know who you are. Yeah, uh, right. Legitimately, it wasn't like a punk or anything, but it came out like that because I don't know who Moose is, right? Well, at the time I didn't know, right? And so here's this guy right. chiming in saying he's Mr. Whatever. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> and I meant nothing by that, but it came off <laughs> like right. that. So. I ran with it. <laughs> so next thing I know, I'm in Bound for Glory working against Moose. And uh, yeah. what, a what a tremendous athlete uh, Moose really? is, man. He, I think he's got a bright um, bright future ahead of him. Um, got a few things I think he can work on. And once he gets some of those things down, man, uh, I, I think he's got a lot of room for growth. Right, right. Yeah, I've, uh, I've wrestled Moose before and uh, it's a treat, but then again, you know, as as big as he is, and he's such an athlete, you know, if he wants to, you know, throw you around, he can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, and thank goodness he's a big athlete like that because <clears throat> I did the same thing there. My first match in Impact, I did a showstopper and a dive over the top rope, and thank goodness he caught me because I think I overjumped my spot. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's another thing. I was watching your match, um, I want to say about a month and a half ago, and the last pay-per-view we had, and you're doing these dives over the top rope, and you're doing all this stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I better step up my game because he's really making <laughs> me look bad and everybody else in the locker room look bad. But yeah, and uh, a lot of people commented on that. It's like, you know, they, 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 they think, you know, um, you know, now I've, I, I heard a lot of good comments. People are like, wow, Shamrock's really, you know, putting it all out there. And, you know, when he don't have to, you know, and, and guys in the locker room, they look up to that, so... Well, and I, I, it's something I think that I've, I've always, you know, tried to challenge myself with is never being comfortable, never being yeah. content. Uh, that every time that you have an opportunity to do something, you have to take that opportunity, even if it's something small, because you never know who's watching. You never know what's going to happen the next day because of what you do. And it could be either good or it could be bad. So if you're putting it all out there and you're working hard and trying to do, you're not always going to come out that way. But uh, when you're out there and you're trying to put your best effort out every single time, then you know that something good will happen from that. But if you go out there and you, you say, well, you know, I just don't feel like working today. Not only are you messing yourself up, but there may be that guy or, or guys or whoever or girl, whatever it is, that you may hurt in that process because one day you come in and decide you don't want to do your job. Uh, so there's a lot more people affected yeah. by how you go into a ring and, and present yourself. So for me, it's like 100% all the time and nothing less. Yeah. Yeah, you hear that, Gary? Gary works for Ford Motor Company and he <laughs> dials it in every time he goes into work. <laughs> got to man you got to you got to joke around with gary gary no. gary's a really good dude man if it wasn't for him i i wouldn't have been able to do a lot of stuff in here here in monroe you know so right on, but we've got to, we definitely got to get you into one of our shows and gary runs the uh it's like uh comic-con over here in monroe yeah. michigan but it's called uh the pop fest so we definitely oh. got to get you in one of these years and do a signing and stuff yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to have the diary IWR too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Wrestling. Yeah, we have a little promotion over here, and Gary really <laughs> promotes that kind of thing. So now, um, I'll never forget a story you told me, uh, Gary. Chime in if you have any questions. You were just breaking in the wrestling business, and I never thought that you. Uh, I thought you came in. I never knew you wrestled professionally before shoot fighting and all that. But you were in the locker room with the Ultimate Warrior. And passed out. I love this story. I can hear it twenty times. And you're looking around like, is anybody like noticing this? Could you well, tell that story? If there, I have a couple different stories that, especially when I first broke in, and this was when I was working for um, Nelson Royal. I was I was actually carrying the strap for uh, Nelson Royal's company, and so uh, WWF came through town on a house show, and they needed some extras. And so um, Nelson, uh, you know, put me in, put me in touch with them. And, and so I was driving down to Winston-Salem and I was going to do a house show for WWF. Right. And this is back when right. I was probably 20, 21 years old. And right. so I go into this uh, uh, place. It's big, right. There's a lot of people there. I've never been in front of an audience <laughs> like this. And I'm like, wow. And I'm probably six, eight months into my, learning right so i was learning really fast and so i get there and i remember i'm in the locker room and i first of all i'm lost i don't know where i'm going everybody's right. saying go this way go that way and i'm i'm lost <laughs> like i no idea right so i finally get to the locker room and there's arn anderson the anderson brothers and uh the ultimate warrior and uh just all these stars right and i'm like right. where am i supposed to change at because it was like <laughs> everybody was in there no no brother you just go in there and i'm like with them. <laughs> so yeah. I walk in, I was in pretty good shape. Um, so I go in there and I, I start getting dressed. And, and so the show starts and which did, at the time I didn't, didn't make sense to me, but now I understand 
Well, the show starts and Ultimate Warrior's up first, right? And I'm thinking, he's main event, right? But it's right. a house show, right? right? So so he goes out there and I'm like, so when we're, and I'm on after him and I'm like, I'm like the fourth or fifth match or something. And I'm with this guy named Mega Man, uh, whatever his name was, tremendous, tremendous body, excellent athlete, but couldn't tell a story to save his life. Right. So I'm sitting on the chair, I'm getting dressed, I'm getting going, I hear the crowd pop. And I kid you not, if it's not maybe 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes total that Ultimate gets up out of his chair, goes to the ring, and he's back in his chair, right? So he, he literally sprints yeah. from the actual entrance into the ring, hits the ropes several times. And I don't see this, right? But I know what he does now, right? And literally sure. beats the guy, boom, jumps out of the ring, sprints back. He runs into the locker room and literally he's blown up like, <gasps> and I'm like, wow, wow. And I'm tying my shoes, ignoring this. Like, okay. He sits down on the chair and he sits there for about five or 10 seconds and he goes to bend over. I thought he was like, he was going to tie his shoe or untie his shoe or something like that. And he does this. Boom. <laughs> literally falls, passes out, falls on the ground. And I'm like, jumped out of my leg. I go, hey, hey, something's wrong. Nobody moves. They're all, and I remember Arn Anderson turns at me. He literally turns, looks, gets that half smile on his face. Ah, he's, don't worry about it, he's fine. I was like, <laughs> CPR, somebody, right. he's dying. Right. And they literally, and we just walked around the dude. Like they yeah. just act like nothing happened. And all of a sudden he, he comes to, and I was like, are you okay? And literally he doesn't answer me, right? He just, are you okay? And he just goes about doing his thing. And I was like, and now I got to go and do my match. And I'm like, man, this is a, that, that just was not normal. Of course now, right. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. now I know it's probably, that's, that's simple compared to what we see. <laughs> <laughs> what you had in store for you. <laughs> I was like, wow. I like, yeah. I like how Ken says back then when he was in shape, look at this guy. Yeah, right, right. right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I guess I should say back when I didn't feel any pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we, uh, when we're down there in Nashville doing some tapings for Impact, you know, everybody goes to the gym and, you know, I'll look over at Ken, Gary, and he's, you know, curling more weight than I'm squatting, and I'm thinking, man, <laughs> either, either I've got to start training at a different hour, or I've got to pick up the beat. <laughs> hey, listen, good, good, good days and bad days, man. I, I have them. Sometimes I can't curl twenty. I have to curl twenty five pounds because I'm just so sore. So, you know how it goes, man. You just get yeah. you, you, you're you're on sometimes where you just feel really good. And then there are some of those months where you just got to back off and relax just right. to stay right. healthy. Right. So, now, when you took uh, two years off, was that with the weights or are you still weight trained? No, I literally stopped everything. And okay. um, I, I didn't. Uh, and I think that's what happens. I got the I, I literally got to experience what a lot of athletes experience, whether it's um, professional uh, basketball, football, wrestling, boxing, MMA, whatever it is, even with jobs, right? I got to experience what it felt like to um, walk away or go away from something that you were comfortable and happy doing, and right. then living a normal life where you stopped being who you were, which is I stopped being an athlete, I stopped training, I stopped, uh, you know, looking in the mirror and being proud of what I've seen. Uh, I stopped doing that. And then inside of me became depressed. I felt mm -hmm. miserable. I felt horrible. Uh, and luckily for me, I realized what it was. It was because I wasn't being the same person I was born to be. And that was be a person that had pride and, and took pride in being in shape and fit. Uh, and when I walked away from that for it was, it was two years or so, uh, it just seemed like I became this person that I didn't know. I, when, I, when I did look in the mirror, I didn't know that person. I literally yeah. was, was looking at something that I did not like. And um, so I changed it. I, I literally said, you know what? 
I, I would rather do things that I love doing and have a short life um, mm -hmm. or uh, rather than do things because it's going to make me live longer, but I'm going to be unhappy. Right, right. Now, uh, now, do you think taking that step back allowed you to take two steps forward? Oh, I think it may allow me to take 20 steps forward because it yeah. was night, night and day, bro. I mean, from what I felt, uh, because I mean, I think you got to look at it from a point of view. And I did look at this from this way. It was when, when I started fighting, it was in 1989. I went to Japan. And I started uh, fighting in the um, UWF. Uh, so from 1989 and 90, um, I was in probably the main event from the time I started my career till the time I ended my career when it came to mixed martial arts. I was the main event, uh, either semi-main event or main event. So I was always fighting the toughest guys, always. That went on for, for 10, 15 plus years, plus being a pro wrestler and getting slammed and beat up and having, you know, 20 matches in 30 days um, takes a toll on your body. So I was constantly challenging myself for 20 plus years and never took a break. I never stepped away and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go away for a year. I never did that. I never took anything longer than a month or a couple months off from an injury, but never right. more than a year. And so I don't think I ever really gave my body a chance to rest and recover. And I yeah. think there's some point in time where athletes during their time um, that they step away, whether not football so much and not basketball, because you can't, it moves too fast, but right. for like pro wrestling and for like combat sports, where it's an individual thing and you have to train to be ready for those things that it's okay to step back for a while and let your body heal and recover because when you come back, you're going to be better. And so right. when I did that for two and a half years, it wasn't on purpose. It was just because I was so beat up and yeah. I couldn't do it anymore. I really lost the will to, to fight for what I, what I, what I like, what I want. And so after two years, I just kind of just stopped and then came to a point where I just said, you know, I don't like this. And the only way I'm going to change it is, is if I go and do something about it. So I did. I went out and started training and started out low. Didn't, didn't think about going back in the ring at all. I just thought about just getting me in shape. And then right. when that happened, I started having people say, dude, you, you look like you could still go. And of course, that planted the bug. And uh, that's where <laughs> the opportunities come in. I started testing myself. And then all of a sudden, I was like, whoa. Uh, man, this is night and day compared to what I was, what I was used to now. So, and even today, um, you know, when I'm in there wrestling, um, I feel, I feel energized. I feel good. I feel like I've got a lot left in the tank and I look at my age and I can't believe that I'm able to continue to have the same mentality and the desire to do what I'm doing right now at my age. Right. Well, a lot of times, you know, people, they get better as they get older. You know, yeah. uh, muscle maturity plus, you know, I think taking that step back really allowed you to, like you said, take 20 steps forward. So, yeah. yeah. Gary, do you have some questions, Gary? Yeah, well, if my internet doesn't stop working. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I, was, I was curious, though, did you start off wrestling uh, before you started any of your mixed martial arts or did, was that something you did through high school and college or anything or is that? Yeah, here's where I where I think a lot of people have a, maybe they're not educated enough about me personally, because when I fought Hoist Gracie, um, there were so many people that um, didn't understand how come I wasn't able to, the first fight, just go in and beat them, or in the second fight, why I was so cautious at what I was doing. And I think because they look at me, they look at me as a seasoned veteran. They look at me as this guy that has a lot of experience, which I don't. Um, I, I fought in tough mans. I won three tough mans. That's, that's, that's just being tough. That's, that's, no, that's not an experienced fighter. You know, I wrestled in high school for two years. I, would, I did well, uh, you know, I mean, I did really well, but that was two years of wrestling. Other than that, I did nothing. I had no experience in anything other than street fight. When I fought um, Hoyce Gracie uh, for the first time, I had two and a half years of experience under my belt, two and a half. 
So when people looked at me and I was a champion over in Japan and I was beating guys that were, you know, 15 to 20 years of experience, you know, I was doing it through just toughness and being able to learn stuff quickly. But when I fought Hoist, there was a whole other ball game because then that gi came in, which I never even understood when we went in to do this. I didn't understand that. So I was going in also against something I didn't see. Um, so the second time I fought him, I came in with a game plan. And the game plan was not to overcommit and to do stupid things to get me caught because I wasn't as good as Hoist. I'm not in the submission style stuff. Uh, but as far as asking ability and just pure, pure determination, um, I, was in, I was better than, than as, as far as I'm concerned and, and, and everything that I have gone into since that time, that my willpower is stronger than anyone's. And so I felt like I had those advantages, but the minute I made a mistake technically because of the gi, I would be in trouble. So I had to make those adjustments to do that. So for me, I think that people have an understanding where I came from. You know, I didn't have professional background. I wasn't an amateur fighter in anything. I wasn't a professional fighter in anything. I jumped right into the pro circuit right from the start. And I learned as I was fighting. You didn't know what you were getting into as far as like Miss Martial Arts when you fought Hoist Gracie the first time. It was kind of a, you know, learn on the fly kind of thing. Yeah, because I, I did it over in Japan and I was winning over there, right? So I understood that because I was training with them. But now when you roll in there against a guy who uses a gi as the weapon, right? That negates power. Like I literally had no power over him because he was able to wrap me up with the gi. And I didn't understand that. I just thought it was a guy walking around in pajamas and I just beat the tar out of him. And so here I was going in there with this cocky attitude and because I had just basically athletically and, and skill wise, I was over in Japan doing really well. And I was beating guys that had so much more experience than me uh, just with pure will and toughness and also learning as I was going, I learned real quick. I could see something and I could just do it. Um, I literally been in a match when I was in a fight one time where I did an actual spinning on a uh, spinning knee bar on somebody because he tried it on me in the fight and he missed it. I blocked him with just pure strength. And so then I turned around and did it on him because I, I, I literally saw it happen in front of me and I did it and, and I actually got it. So for me, I, my mind worked really well that way. And that's why I knew that's where I wanted to go because it all came so easy for me. But again, like I said, when you're talking about a gi and you don't understand the gi, it, it literally, and, and it's hard for people to understand uh, as strong as I was, you know, me and Hoist were the same weight. I know they tried to pump it up saying he was 160 pounds or whatever. That, he's one inch taller than me and his shoulders are wider than mine. So we were 10 pounds within each other. There was not much of a weight difference. So when we were in, in there, we were the two smallest guys in there and we were the two toughest guys. But Hoist, using that gi, literally eliminated any strength and any athletic ability that I had over him. So in the second fight, I had to come up with a strategy that literally took the abilities that I had and be able to put them in the right places for me to be effective. And that was to basically just stay in his guard, make him attack me, and I'll block and counter him. Because if I was to lead out, I would set myself up to be submitted because I didn't know where I, where I should or shouldn't go. Right. Now, Looking back, Gary, um, I, I think you could agree with me. Now, when you guys, you know, there's a big difference between the tough man contests and mixed martial arts and UFC and everything. And it seems like the, the UFC kind of started out like a tough man thing. But when you and Hoist would get in there and like Severin, um, you guys kind of, it seems like it changed. That was a starting point to what it is now. Do you agree or uh, I think that me and Hoist were able to take advantage of mm -hmm. the skill sets that we had because we were definitely more skilled uh, in that type of fighting. You know, you talk about Gerard Godot. Um, me and Hoist wouldn't stand a chance with Gerard in a kickboxing match. You know, we just wouldn't. I mean, he would kill us. Um, yeah. And so because of the type of fighting we were in, we were able to get it to the ground. And because of this knowledge that we had, we were so much better than the, the rest of them because nobody knew the submission game and we did. Right. Uh, but Hoyce had 25 years of experience uh, on me. Uh, you know, I had two and a half years, he had 25 years plus 50 years with his family behind him. So there was, and, and of course they ran the tournament. They took my shoes away and all kinds of other stuff that would, even though he still had the advantage, they still were 
in, in the rule sets and the way that they were challenging us in these different areas, it was even leaning more uh, in that way. So, but again, like I said, if I was in their shoes and I was putting on a show and I was marketing what I wanted to market, I'd have done the same thing. So right. it is what it is, you know, and we, we stepped in, we fought. And uh, so I thought what I did was good, uh, was able to compete and be able to challenge myself, which is what it was all about anyways, is me getting in there and challenge myself to another level and being able to expose um, the UFC to the fan base out there. And we were able to do that and be able to have what we have now have today as the UFC. Right. So did that make you grow as a fighter then? It changed your fighting style, learning more about uh, the gi and the mixed martial arts and the submission holds and all that? I think the biggest thing it did, and, and I think this is something that any athlete that has success uh, does, is it, it, when you get into a situation where you're basically having a lot of success, right? Your mind can kind of wander into that world of ego and cockiness. And that's where I was, that's where I was going. I mean, I literally felt like there was nobody that could beat me. And then I was letting everybody know it. And so what happened to me was, I think was a real wake up call for me when I got choked out by a guy wearing a gi and I literally <laughs> told everybody that he was wearing pajamas and made fun of him. And here I'm now this guy wearing pajamas choking me out with those pajamas. <laughs> so it woke me up. It was like one of those wake up calls where you're like, okay, I deserve that. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, but don't you think that adds when you're talking all that, you know, that adds to the, the, the promotional stuff and all that stuff? Yeah, you know, and I, it's funny because I still get guys um, to this day, uh, and I even hear some of them in some of their interviews is like, listen, I'm not much of a talker. I don't need to go in there and make a lot of noise. I'm not a, I'm not a guy that goes out and talks trash. And, and I just think to myself, I said, you know, that's the reason why when you're done fighting, you'll go quietly into the night because mm -hmm. the people that are going to stand out. I mean, when you think of the UFC back in the early days, you think of Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie. You just do. Why? Because we were loud. I was loud. Uh, Tito Ortiz he's loud you look at today when you look at today and you ask people anything about the ufc the first thing that comes out of the mouth is conor mcgregor even though dc and stipe just fought yeah. but conor mcgregor is the most talked about guy is it because he's a great fighter no because khabib beat him but is people talking about khabib like they're talking about conor mcgregor no Conor McGregor gets all these things. He gets to go box people. He gets to go fight whoever he wants to box. He makes millions of dollars. Why? Because he's a good guy? No, because they know they can sell tickets because he knows how to get the audience engaged. And that's the key. It's not about talking trash. It's about getting the audience engaged in your fight. They right. actually go hand in hand with wrestling too. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of wrestling, now, when you went to uh, WWF back then in the – 90s now you you went from ufc to the we we touched on this in the car i, I want to say last week or something um you know you got a lot of slack from the the, the shoot fighters or something but you're kind of like the first one to to go from you know mixed martial arts well a lot of people didn't know your past professional wrestling right. prior to ufc and shoot fighting and martial arts um now, did you, what type of uh, heat did you get from like everybody in the mixed martial arts world? Yeah, when I first made the crossover there, uh, I got people from my own gym um, mm -hmm. that started questioning my thought of what, why I was doing what I was doing. And again, like I said, I'm not that kind of guy that will go out and tell people what my personal business is. Uh, you know, that's, that's stuff for me to work out. It's not their problem. You know, I paid for the gym. I paid for the house they lived in. I bought the food they lived in for, that they ate. So I took care of everything. And the only way I could do that was making sure I had money coming in. So I had to put whatever I was doing on hold in order to be able to follow the dream that I first set out to go get. And that was be an MMA fighter, be in that MMA world, and then also being able to train fighters and be able to have, be able to have some sort of legacy in that world. And so when I made that change, I made it because it was a financial decision I had to make because they weren't able to pay me the money that they, they said they were going to pay me.
but I mm -hmm. understood it because they were going through a lot of court. They were being pushed out of a lot of different states. They were having issues. And so when I sat down and talked with Bob Meyerowitz and them, I understood where they were coming from. There was no, there was no, there was no animosity between us. But I also told them, I said, you have to understand my position. I've got three children. I've got 12 fighters. I've got three houses, one that the fighters are living in, one that the group home kids are living in because we were taking care of, you know, at-risk kids that my father was running the home. And then I had my house. And so I was taking care of all these things, plus the gym where we had a weight training area, we had a matted area, and we had a stand-up area, kickboxing and boxing area. So it was all connected. So I was taking care of all this. My bill each month at this time was $30,000. That's what the bill was just for that. So here I was trying to take care of all this, this world that these guys were living in, and they were hammering me. They were saying I was going to sell out, that I shouldn't go. And I was like, listen, I'm doing what I got to do. Um, why I'm doing it is none of your business. You guys focus on what you need to do. I'm not closing the gym. I'm not closing the lion's den. It will keep going as is. The only thing is, is that Frank and Jerry Bolander will be running this gym. And then, of course, as I was gone, I had my brother stab me in the back. And then, of course, some other guys who Jerry Bolin was great, never had a problem with him. But there was a few other guys that that um, uh, Maury Smith being the other one I brought in for the kickboxing coach, uh, him and Frank formed an alliance. Um, and they thought that was perfectly fine, that they could form an alliance after I paid for Maury to come in and train. I, I, I paid for Frank to be there and train, took him out of prison, put him in my house, let him live there. Mm -hmm. And then those guys formed an alliance while I was gone. And then they left and started their own thing, which I don't care about them starting their own gym. He could have came to me and said, dude, I just can't train here. I, I got to go do my own thing. And I would have said, yeah, no problem, man. We could have stayed at least aligned, but instead right. they went behind my back and they took off and, and left. And so that's the stuff I dealt with when I went to pro wrestling. Even the fans were mm -hmm. saying that I was a sellout. Now, if I didn't succeed in the WWF and I would have been went there and I would have failed and they would have beat me or jobbed me or whatever they would have done because it wasn't working out, right. then I wouldn't be here today. My, my mm -hmm. legacy would not be. So everything hinged on the idea that whatever decision I made, I had to be successful at it because everything else would have fell down. That's the right. risk I took. And I was able to accomplish and get through that. And now it's acceptable. Now everybody does it. Even DC's talking about coming back, right? So it's right. almost like the thing to do when you're done fighting in MMA is to go do pro wrestling in the WWF or Impact Wrestling. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of like you paved the way. And I, I remember when uh, you, you uh, started out, because I was already in wrestling at the time, pro wrestling. And, and I'm thinking to myself, wow. I'm like, you know, the crossover, I was for it, you know, because right. you, you gained so much success. And it was such a win-win situation for WWF, especially they were trying to bring some legitimacy to the, the wrestling world. They were getting away from those characters like uh, Doink the Clown and all that stuff. And not on purpose, them. not on purpose. Because oh, really? if you remember, remember this, when I went there, mm -hmm. they already had Hogan, Nash, Hall, Hunter, Hunter Hearst of all people, they all left right. and went to WCW. Right. So Vince was forced to go in a different direction. And I don't know how people feel about Vince. Uh, I have my thoughts on him. You know, we didn't agree eye to eye on a lot of stuff, but Vince was a genius in a lot of right. different ways for him to right. be able to have this kind of success this many years and through all this turbulent time, he was able to always figure something out that would go over with the fans. And he did it in this case where he brought me in with the idea of basically coming in and changing wrestling, like going, let's do something different. Let's put it on the edge. Let's put it on the edge of where reality is. And let's bring in somebody that's a legitimate tough guy in this mixed martial arts world. And let's create characters around him. He never, he didn't do it with me. He basically brought me in and allowed that to filter through with all the other characters like Stone Cold and Bret Hart and some of the other guys, you know, you look at Goldberg, um, all these characters started developing because of my entrance into yeah. the world of pro wrestling. And then all these other tough guys came out. Yeah. I remember when I went there in 2001, they were going for more realistic names. You know, that's what they were trying to say, you know, and uh, Ryan has always been like a, a, a gimp, uh, not a gimmick, but a nickname. You know, that's why I was able to keep that. So mm -hmm. I remember because they tried to change it because 
they were having a hard time with the patent and stuff. So that's why we changed it to a Y over there. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, I you, that's a big that's a big plus, brother, because you and I both know um, it's hard to make a living when you basically built your career on something and then all of a sudden you've got to stop in the middle of it and you got to rebuild that character. Right, right, or reinvent yourself, you know, right. and name and all that stuff. With with you coming from uh, wrestling to mixed martial arts, is is it a hard transfer to be able? I mean, because like in mixed martial arts, you're there to hurt somebody. You know, you're there to win. And in wrestling, you're kind of there to make it look like you're going to hurt somebody but not actually hurt somebody. Is that a hard transfer to do that? Or is that something that – because, I mean – Yeah, it's funny because uh, uh, God rest his soul, but Van Vader would tell you, yeah, he had a hard time transitioning over. He broke my nose. (laughs) So, being Vader, I was very fortunate to um, work with him in my first match because Vader was used to that kind of style. He was over in Japan and he had done some shoot stuff himself. And so when Vince put me with him, uh, I needed to be able to find that where I was at, like what was, was acceptable, what wasn't. So me and Vader went in there and we went, we went at it a little bit. And I felt like I could, because I remember he comes up to me, he goes, Hey brother, don't worry about it, man. You know, just, let's just go in there. Um, don't, Whatever you do, don't don't pull back to where it looks uh, not real. We just go after it, and and we'll we'll work on it afterwards. Don't worry about hurting me. You're not going to hurt me. And I was like, man, I appreciate it. And so we went in there. And we had a great match, uh, you know. And I was stiff, but I at least I had a gauge of like, okay, now I know what it feels like. It's okay. It's like when I was in there training uh, somebody for a fight. I would be in there and spar with them, but I wasn't going to try to hurt them because they got to fight. I can't hurt them. I can't cut them. I can't break their nose. You know, I can't allow them to get hurt. So what do I do? I've got to throw punches to be able to know that they've been hit, but without actually hitting them. That's like sparring, right? Same when you're grappling, when you put a hold on somebody, you catch and release. It's the same thing in pro wrestling. So I was getting, when I went with Vader, it was in between that, the sparring and the other stuff, because it was like, I didn't understand, I mean, even though I had done it before, I, this was at this level, right? Like these were, these were these guys up here and they're big. And so I had to find where that was, what was acceptable was it. And being able to go with Vader, I was able to one, put on a great show, my first, first outing out and two, be able to go, okay, what do I need to learn? And be able to have guys like Bret Hart, you know, and even Vader go, listen, if you dial that down about 10 notches, he says, that's going to be perfect. He says, you could go ahead and touch people. He said, but we need to dial it back just a bit. He said, but it was all fine. No problem. He said, but at least now you have somewhere that's something to gauge it with. And so for me, it was really a huge, huge help for me to be able to go in and have a match and not be so concerned about hurting someone. Uh, and then I could just go and then be able to be talked to afterwards and say, okay, now if you just back that up about 10 notches, I think that's where you need to be. And then I was able to go in and have another match and I was able to dial it down a little bit and find my range in there. And I was able to gain trust with all the boys. And I think that's the biggest um, challenge of a locker room is being able to, especially where I came from, uh, is to be able to earn the trust with the guys you're getting in the ring with. Yeah. Now you had a long feud with Vader, didn't you? Didn't you guys go back and forth to WWE or WWF and then Japan? And that was a- yeah. Yeah, actually, one time we were in Japan, and he did a power bomb. I said, you know, he's going to power bomb me twice, like bam and bam. And first time he power bombed me, um, I was dealing with because I was on the road. I was working with WWF, and I had a tear in my lung. I didn't know it at the time. It was a tear, and what was happening was I was coughing up blood. Right, every so often I just cough up blood, and <clears throat> I couldn't figure out what it was. Well, then and I was in Japan, I literally power bombed me one time, and I started spitting up blood. I started choking. And I, he was going to power bomb me again. And I kicked him off and said, cover me. And so we did whatever he needed to do. He don't even remember how it ended, but uh, he gets the, he gets the cover. He gets the win. And I remember thinking I rolled out of the ring and, and I get back to the locker room, man. And I I'm choking. And so I go to the doctors because I'm coughing up all this blood and it ends up stopping after about an hour. Well, what was happening is every time I was getting slammed or taking a bump, the lung, my lung was, tearing a little bit each time it was a little bit tear and it would open up it would bleed a little bit and it would close back up it's like a paper cut right it'll bleed a little bit then it'll yeah. close well that's what was happening with my lung well then when he power bombed me it ripped open a little bit more and it started to flood in 
and then it closed back up again. But every time that I would breathe or whatever, it opened up again, it would fill up again. So it was, it was slowly um, not closing as fast. That's why I was choking. So they said I had to, and it was not, there's nothing you could do, but just not wrestle for a month or two because it'll heal back like a paper cut. It'll heal pretty fast. Right. Um, so, but that was scary too, because it very easily, it could have just ripped open. I'd have died. Right. So um, I pushed him off. Thank God. Cause if he gave me another one, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Right. Right. Now, uh, did you ever wrestle for like New Japan or? Oh, or by the way, Japan? by the way, wrestling's fake, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, did you wrestle for, uh, a lot of fans don't know if you wrestled for All Japan or New Japan or any uh, professional wrestling companies over there. Yeah, I work with Baba's group. Um, and uh, I, especially when I first went over there, my first experience, and I worked with Doug Furness and Danny Crawford. Um, the Can-Am connection. Um, I learned a lot mm -hmm. from those guys. Um, it was a great time. I was over there for, I believe, six weeks. It was about six weeks um, and learned a lot because, like I said, I was only in six or eight months at the time. It was the time I was doing the WWF thing. I did three house shows for WWF, went over to Japan. This was all within a year of my training. And so I had a real quick um, jump into the, the space there. And so it was, it was pretty awesome. And then um, I had gone back, but then when I went back, I'd actually gone back for a shoot style, shoot the work shoot style with UWF. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, Fujiwara Gumi when he opened his company. And then, of course, uh, Pancras. Right, right. Now, see, a lot of people, like when I was a kid, I didn't know wrestling was big over in Japan, you know, until right. I got older and I got into it. If I would have known that, I would have been trading tapes and stuff like that because I'm a big fan of that style and, yeah, all that stuff, so... Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot faster, and it's uh, and and I hear a lot of people say you don't sell. That's not true. You sell, but it's mm -hmm. it's less frequent. Right, right. Have That's you guys like fought Gary. each other? Besides oh, Gary, uh, as have you guys fought each other? Oh no, no we've no. never been in the ring before. No. I, I I I'm not that dumb, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, don't let him fool you, man. He's a, he's a big dude, man. So his body hits someone, you feel it. <laughs> I think that's, why they, awesome. that's why they call him Rhino. Rhino, yeah. Because <laughs> he's still delicate. I paid him to say that, Gary. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be an awesome uh, main event in Monroe. Right, right. <laughs> maybe he'd hey, be my like, partner. <laughs> I would be, listen, uh, you know, I think we all know uh, Rhino's credentials and uh, he's a true professional. Uh, one of the good guys in the business, you know, uh, good with people, um, but he's smart too. So um, I would enjoy uh, having the opportunity to work with him. No question. Yeah, that would be fun. Hey, yeah. we might have a main event. Hey, we got to yeah. get Gary in there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> hey. We got a fall guy. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> there he is. All right, so uh, we're, I, I know we've taken a lot of your time. I greatly appreciate it. No uh, Gary, do you have any other questions, or what can they expect out of the future with uh, Ken, um, you know, in your future as far as impact or what else, and, you know, where people can follow you and find you and stuff like that? Well, I don't know yet with impact. Like I said, you know, my last experience there was that, you know, um, it was a little disappointing, you know. I mean, I was in there with Sammy, and and uh, we had that chance to to get the titles, and you know, I, uh, just you know, man, like you said, when you get to a point where things are working for you, and you just don't you don't think about stuff, right? And you just go do it. And that last time when I when I did that dive over the top rope, you know, it it wasn't smooth, it wasn't crisp, you know, I missed it, and so it, you know, it, it definitely cost us. Uh, you know, in whatever way you want to say that, but yeah, just like I said, I, I think I, I took some, as, as everybody knows, I've kind of been away from it for a while. So uh, we'll see what comes next. We'll see what comes okay. next. Like I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't ever like to make any statements or say anything until I have time to really think, think things over to see what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, right now I think, um, you know, we'll just see, we'll just see what happens as the landscape starts to open up. We'll see what happens. Right. I'm still trying to get Heath Slater in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, listen, um, 
everybody has to has to have an opportunity you know we all right. got kids we all got kids right. and we all got to feed them <laughs> i don't know what your plans are with valor moving forward yeah know. that's uh that's good too because uh that's that's um, uh, i say this all the time uh when people, people ask what that is about if they don't valor. know Actually. yeah valor's a valor's a bare knuckle um competition where it's basically if i can just explain it to if you were to watch a boxing match take the gloves off, take the tape off. And that's, that's Valor bare knuckle. Our box, our rules are the same. Everything is the same. We don't have as many rounds because uh, with bare knuckle, you're not going to go 12 rounds, right? So we go three rounds with three minutes and um, it's exciting. It's fast. Uh, it's an organization. And a thought I came up with for the love of, of bare knuckle. I've always believed bare knuckle is in its purest form. Um, and I always, I always kind of like to have people, understand what it is to have no gloves and gloves on and the way I do that is as I say people look at boxing and they go man those guys are really good and I will say yeah um you know and they'll say Pacquiao's better than Mayweather and I'll say well you know the record doesn't show that but I, I get what you're saying but here's the thing if you really want to find out whether a guy is a true badass or a fighter take the gloves off because if you're great with gloves on, do you, do you truly walk around in the streets with boxing gloves on? I mean, could Mayweather be tough on the street? I've never seen him get into a street fight. You know, I've never right. seen him actually have a problem there and actually fight somebody. It's always in a controlled area with boxing gloves on. But if you were to take boxing gloves off, would people be as good as they are, even MMA? There was a reason why MMA back in the early days where there was very few people that fought in it. it wasn't because they didn't have people uh, wanting to do it. They had people not wanting to do it. <laughs> you didn't have boxers come and say, I'll fight or right. wrestlers or judo players or all these other guys that were in this combative thing go, I'll fight. No, because it was always open and we were looking for the highest level of caliber of fighters, but none of them were volunteering. There's a reason for that. Because right. bare knuckle is a different world and it's a different beast. I believe bare knuckle is where you find out who the truest warriors are, the truest badasses are, because they won't think twice about doing it because they don't need anything to make them good. They are good with God given talent. That's all they need. That's all they want. So valid bare knuckle to me uh, is God given talent. And I think is, is in my opinion, my humble opinion, is the next big combat sports coming down? Sign, yeah. sign me and Terry up. <laughs> sign Gary up. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to let you go. It's been it's been awesome. I I honored to have you on. Thanks, Terry, for setting that up. That's it's just well. Thanks, Ken, for coming on. Um, where can people find you at on social media? Yeah, you can find me on uh, kenshamrock.com and uh, I have all my social media sites on there. So if you if you go to my website, you can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those things, if they're all on there. And also too, we have all our updates on Valor BK. Um, also too, if people want to get in contact with me and bring me in for something like that, you can also find that also on my website, kenshamrock.com. Nice, nice. Hey, thanks, Ken. Thanks for helping us out. Thanks for coming on the show. It was great. I could talk to you for another two hours. Uh, so. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, man. Appreciate right, we'll it. We'll see you at for glory, if not sooner. Appreciate you, brother. All right. Thank you. Uh, bye. This episode can be found on uh, Facebook, and then we're going to be on YouTube. And pretty soon, it should be uploaded on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and Impact Radio. Uh, so check it out. Subscribe. This week's episode was from Deck Burners is buying Magic the Gathering and sealed boxes. Deck burners will also purchase collections of comics, Dungeons and Dragons, and other RPGs, as well as coins, gold, and silver. Deck burners is located at 5071 North Dixie Highway, Suite 7, Newport, Michigan, inside Supermatch Gun Shop. They are open seven days a week, and you can contact them by phone 734 384 3806 or email them at blix70 at charter. You still there, Terry? Yeah, still there. All right. I thought you were leaving me. Uh, oh, no, I, I thought we were done. And then, uh, it, yeah, that was a great uh, that was a great interview, man. He's a class-ass guy, man. Yeah. yeah I, never... I, just the people, I mean, Hoist Gracie, uh, Tito yeah. Ortiz, on and on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, seriously, well, to get you and him. 
the, 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 you know, the, the crazy thing about it is, is, you know, he, he runs around that locker room and you see him in the ring and stuff. You think he's 25, you know, <laughs> I'm walking around. He, he looks 25. I'm, I'm, he looks 25. You see those, <laughs> those guns? Yeah. But, uh, we're still really, live. So we want to tell everybody thanks yeah, for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. And uh, yeah, no. we'll have to tell Dave to sign us off. Yeah. There's Dave. Where's Dave? <laughs> Where's Dave? Sign us I'm off, here. Dave. Oh, Sign there you go. I was listening to you guys finish your wrap-up talk. Uh, oh, we're wrapped. It's up. All right. Well, then let me uh, – there goes that.